All right, grab a seat. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> My wife is a uh, middle school teacher, so I feel like a middle school teacher. Everybody sit down, okay? Take your seats. Hey, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, uh, I thank you even that we can be out here this morning and, and, and just uh, every time we're out here, I just thank you, Lord, for uh, Pastor Ron and, and, and Marlene and and getting this campus with this beautiful space to be able to come out here and worship outside. And we thank you for that. And uh, this morning as we come here, we don't just come here to interact with people and talk and eat burgers. We come here because we want to hear from you. We want to be challenged. We want to discover what your heart is. What, what is your vision for this church, God? We could care less what people's vision is. We want to hear what you are doing and what you're up to in this community. And God, that doesn't happen through an eloquent speech or su superior wisdom, but instead through a demonstration of your Holy Spirit's power so that our faith doesn't rest upon man, but instead upon your power. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So uh, you want to take the notes, the notes are in the bulletin, or you can go on your phone to your app store and search for Calvary Mac and download our app and you then click on today's bulletin and, uh, and that should come right up and you'll see that there and you can follow along with us. Uh, but this morning, we've been going through the book of Revelation. Uh, we finished Revelation chapter four last week. We're going verse by verse through the whole book. Next week, we'll pick that back up with chapter five. But, but once a year, we pause to talk about vision. And, and when we say vision, as I was talking earlier, um, it's pretty typical to have like a vision Sunday in the fall and, and here's what we're doing this year and here's all this exciting things. And, and I was praying about it and thinking about it this week and I'm just like, man, I could care less what my vision for this church is. You know, Lord, Lord what are you doing? We, we can't just use the world's strategies and and leadership principles to build a church. It's not our job to build the church. Jesus said he would build the church. And so what this week is, is Lord, what, what are you doing in this church? We want to tap into that and find out. And so as we've been going through the book of Revelation, if you, if you haven't been here, these are night vision goggles. This has been what we've used to kind of picture what the book of Revelation is all about. It's like night vision goggles. You know, everybody argues about what it is. This is it simply. So that as culture and society gets darker and darker, we can see what's actually going on. And I don't know about you, but I've been fairly blown away at how the Lord has just been revealing these things. We've been going through the, the seven letters we finished that a couple weeks ago. The, the, the book of Revelation starts off with seven letters written to seven literal historic churches that existed in 95 AD. And it's been spectacular. You can see the graph there at the top of your notes that describes how these letters were written to historic churches in 95 AD by Jesus through John. John was, Jesus was dictating it. And all of these letters that he was writing, what they actually did is they didn't just address the specific circumstances of that time, but it predicted the next 2000 years of church history in detail. And if you want to find out more about that, just go online and watch the study from the beginning. But you'll notice as, as we get to the last two churches specifically, we had the missionary age of the church. And you can see that was from around AD 1730 until I put it the date as, as, as 2019. Most uh, Bible scholars would put that that letter was written and it was written to the missionary church. That age ended sometime in the 20th century and we don't know exactly what it was. I personally feel it was 2019 because really, I mean, you look at how here's 9-11, how the world was transformed. Doesn't seem like every year something else flips this world upside down. 
and how 2019, something significantly changed in 2019 into 2020 with the, with the COVID pandemic. And we talked about how for the last 300 years, there's been this open door of missionary, of, of missionary work across the world. But over the last 300 years, that door has been shutting until now. Missionary, international missionary work, it's kind of gone to a standstill. And it's almost like that door, it's, it's just about shut. And we've entered this, this last age of the church, which was that, that book or that letter, excuse me, to the church at Laodicea, which I called the materialistic church. It started somewhere in the mid 1900s, so 1950 or so. And how the church has become more and more materialistic. Most Bible scholars call it something even harsher. They call it the apostate church. The church that has kind of left the reservation. And, and, and you look at these things and sociologists, they pick up on this too. The first blank on your notes there is, is three types of societies. The first one is a Christian society. And so the Christian society, that's basically what existed in the Western world for the past 300 years, is a Christian society. That is the Judeo-Christian worldview is primary, is that first blank. The Judeo-Christian worldview is primary in the public square, accepted morals, and the zeitgeist of the age. You guys know what the word zeitgeist means? It's one of the coolest words ever. It's like the spirit of the age. And Anytime I can use that word, I use that word. It's a great one. I think I got it off of like a, you know, word of the day calendar. I don't know. Okay. Post-Christian society is the loss of the primary primacy of the Judeo-Christian worldview in the public square, accepted morals, and the zeitgeist of the age in favor of alternative worldviews such as secularism, humanism, or nationalism. And so you can see, I mean, that, that's, that, that's what happened about 40, 50 years ago is suddenly Christianity was no longer the primary worldview in the Western society. And humanism and secularism started coming up more and more forefront. You know, just, just time out with the queen passing away. People have talked about on the news. It's like an end of an era. Well, the era that that points to it is kind of the last 300 years of the way the world has functioned. It's, it's kind of coming to an end and we're on to a new era here, which I believe happened in 2019, which is the anti-Christian society. That's where we're at today. The approved ideologies in the public square, accepted morals and the zeitgeist of the age are hostile to the Judeo-Christian worldview. And I believe that's where we're at. Where it's no longer, it's not just that it's Christianity is one of a number of views. Christianity has been removed from public conversation and culture has grown more and more hostile to running into a mic stand. I keep backing up because I'm like in the sun and Anyway, uh, there we go. I can't see it. There we go. So, so it, it's, it's, we've moved into this new era of an anti-Christian society. And I'm sure some of you are sitting here going, great, Brian, this is a really great Vision Sunday. I feel really inspired. But I don't know about you, but the past few weeks, as we've gone through and looked at the book of Revelation, it is exceedingly comforting to know that Jesus laid out that all this would happen. It's comforting because it's like, you know, we know that he knows. And this was all predicted. And we're sitting here going, man, he knew about this. He knew what would be happening in McMinnville, Oregon in 2022, he knew about it in 95 AD and he told John all about it. To me, that's, that's comforting, which means we are not here by accident. The implication being this, that God has placed us as a gathering of Jesus followers in a hostile anti-Christian culture for such a time as this. We are here 
for such a time as this. You, many of you, you'll see these shirts every once in a while. I think we, we gave out these shirts a couple of years ago. They must've been cool because you still see them every once in a while. But it's just for. And the idea is that we are, because we are for the Lord, we are for Yamhill County. We are for Gaston. We are for Willamina. We are for McMinnville. Because we are for the Lord. Well, we're, we're, we're adding to this. We started doing this last summer. We are here for such a time as this. So as, as I was praying about, well, how do we capture the heart of where we're at, not just as a society, but as a church, the Lord kept taking me back to that passage of where that phrase comes from, that we are here for such a time as this. And that's the book of Esther. It's Esther chapter four. If you want to take your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Esther chapter four. And what we're going to see is we're going to see events in another anti-Christian culture. It was an anti-Jewish culture. It was the Persian culture in the fifth century BC. And basically the Persian empire is where modern day Iran is. And, and it all happens in the city of Susa. And, and there was a king. It was King Xerxes. This is the fifth century BC, capital of, Cersei, uh, of Susa. King Xerxes, he, he got rid of, he banished his wife. And he basically did, uh, you know, Persia's next top model to find a new wife. And he finds a young Jewish woman and her name was Hadassah, but her Persian name was Esther. And he basically chooses this young woman to be his new wife. Well, meanwhile, Hadassah, Esther, her uncle Mordecai, he refuses to, to bow down and kneel. The, the king had, had lifted up his right-hand man. His name was Haman, had, had lifted him up and commanded everybody to honor him. But Mordecai refused to bow. And this drove Haman nuts. And actually, let's start in the previous chapter, chapter three. Look at verse five, just for the context. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy Mordecai's people the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. You know, Haman was just one in a long line of evil people who have tried to wipe out the Jewish people. If you are just kicking the tires about what it means to follow God, look at the Jewish people. And what I mean by that, if, if you're kind of you know, more in the atheist camp, the agnostic camp, then just ask yourself a question, a simple question. Why is it for the past 4,000, 5,000 years, empires, whatever the dominant empire has been, it seems, they have tried to wipe out the Jewish people, but have failed. Why is that if there is no God? I mean, just look at this. Here's just a short list of kingdoms and empires that have tried to wipe out genocide the entire nation of Israel. Look at this, ancient Egypt tried to, the Amalekites, the Philistines, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, that's what we're reading about here, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Crusaders, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and today modern Iran. Why is that? Well, Haman is just one of the long line of leaders who have tried to destroy them. The next blank there, without the right lens, one might see the constant attempts to destroy the Jewish people as mere racism or anti-Semitism. However, empires attempting genocide against Israel before the cross were mere pawns in Lucifer's hands to destroy the bloodline of the Messiah. After the cross, after Jesus, such empires were or are mere pawns of Lucifer's revenge and desperation. Every time they tried to wipe out the bloodline of the Messiah, the reason Haman wanted to wipe out the Jewish people 
is he thought it was just because Mordecai didn't bow to him. But the truth was that this was an idea inspired by Satan himself. Lucifer was an angel in heaven that led a rebellion against God. And God cast him in a third of the angels down to the earth. And he's trying to constantly destroy God's people. Well, he inspired Haman to try to wipe out the Jewish people in an attempt to destroy Jesus before Jesus was ever born by killing the people that he was supposed to be coming from. Does that make sense? So Haman deceives King, or King Xerxes into believing the Jews must be wiped out. So verse 10, so the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. So basically he says, okay, Haman, go ahead, wipe out the Jewish people. Wipe them out, kill them, destroy them. Jump down to verse 13. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month of the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. You know, we, we talked about how quickly our own society has moved from a Christian society to a post-Christian society, to now an anti-Christian society. We're not the first society to exist in history that is anti-God's people. Here is one right here. This was a society utterly hostile to the Judeo-Christian worldview. This was an attempt at annihilation, at genocide of the bloodline of the Messiah to keep Jesus from ever being born. And to motivate people into taking part in this genocide, the order was, when you kill the Jews, you get to keep their stuff. It's pretty good motivation. You go kill somebody, you keep all of their stuff. Keep it all. Just like the Nazis have done or tried. And then we get to chapter four, verse one. When Mordecai learned all, remember Mordecai is Esther's uncle who raised her. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes. That was a way of showing that you're in mourning, in deep mourning. And he went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king had come, came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Mordecai, he responds the way that Jews have responded for thousands of years every time. Genocide has been attempted against the Jews. They respond with wailing and, and tearing their clothes to show extreme grief. But for Mordecai, it was worse. It was his fault. It wasn't his fault, but he felt it was his fault because he's the one who refused to bow to Haman. His refusal to bow led to this existential crisis for his people. And so he, he tears his clothes and puts on sackcloth and goes out to the king's gate in mourning because his people's existence was in danger. And Mordecai went to the king's gate. This was not only where he worked, but it was also as close as he could get to the palace where his niece Esther lived because every Jew in the Persian empire knew they were sentenced to death. Every Jew in the Persian empire knew what was going on except for one, and that was Esther. Now the king didn't even know that Esther was a Jew. He just knew she was hot. 
but she's the only one in the empire. And so Mordecai goes to the king's gate because it's as close as he could get to the palace. By the way, did you know that the ruins of Susa of this palace have been found in Iran? We can't go there because it's obviously shut down from the Iranian government. But those archaeologists who've actually gotten in have gone into the palace and it's set up exactly like the Bible describes here and where the king's gate is. I've seen archaeologists who have walked along where they start where Esther's room was and they go down in the ruins, the hallway, to where she would have to face off against the king. This isn't mythology. This is history. This happened. Verse four, when Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She's in great distress, not because of the edict to kill all the Jews. She's in distress because her uncle Mordecai, who raised her, her parents died. They're gone. He raised her. He's upset and in mourning. And all she knows is that her uncle, who she loves, is in mourning. She didn't know about the edict because they didn't know she was a Jew, so they wouldn't have told her. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai, in the open square of the city, in front of the king's gate, Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and explain it to her. And he told her to instruct told him to instruct her to go to the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. So over the previous few years, Esther's world had been turned upside down again and again and again. She'd been orphaned, lived in exile in a foreign country, raised by her uncle only to be taken from her home to be married to a foreign stranger. However, the news she just heard revealed her entire world was in complete meltdown. I know some of you feel like your world is in complete meltdown. I know it because I feel that way sometimes. You know, we, we've been doing the month of fasting and prayer over the past couple weeks and it goes on through September and every day we fast from something different. Do you know how refreshing it's been that a couple times this week, like I haven't been able to read my phone for news because we're fasting from it? Because you just, if you look at the news, it's like, can it get worse? And then the next day it gets worse. And it feels like our world's being turned upside down, left and right. Things we used to be able to depend upon, we can't depend upon anymore. You have to be careful with your kids about everything. There's a war for the heart of our kids going on, left and right. And, and sometimes you're just like, just stop the world. I want to get off. We're not the first people to have our worlds turned upside down. We're just the first people who can complain about it on social media. <laughs> this is why our study through the book of Revelation is so important. Whether or not we're in the, you know, getting to the end, the finish line, it may be 500 years from now, I don't know. But I'll tell you this, book of Revelation, as we're looking at this, we look and it's like we, we see through these night vision goggles going, man, it's getting dark. Oh, I see what's going on. That's why God's word is so precious. We have that hope. Well, knowing God is at work in the midst of darkness doesn't make it easy. In fact, acting on that knowledge 
may lead to risk to risking everything. But Esther was there for such a time as this. Verse nine, Hafak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courts without being summoned, uh, without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death. The king extends his gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. We have to guard against reading this with Western eyes. Esther wasn't like, you know, Kate Middleton to Prince Andrew. Is that her husband? Is that right? It's not like that. She was nothing more than a trophy wife. He had large harems of women to keep him satisfied and happy. Her job was just to be there as a a statement of how powerful of a king he is because she's so beautiful and to produce heirs to the throne. That was her job. She wasn't a politically powerful king. I mean, notice how long it's been since since Esther had even been invited to the king's presence, 30 days. This wasn't a love relationship. He had plenty of girls to sleep with. So for her to go to the king would mean to risk her life. No one could go uninvited, not even the queen. And the penalty was death. And by the way, remember what happened to his first wife? He banished her. This was a risky situation. She had a, she faces a bigger risk against his law, but Esther was there for such a time as this. Verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For you to remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. As I've been praying in, over this whole year and like, God, where are you taking this church? What are you up to? What are you doing? Boom, that's God's vision for this church. This is our vision as a church. We are here for such a time as this. This is why we live different. You know, Mordecai was wise enough to recognize that all this beauty pageant stuff that that got Esther into the position she was at was no accident. Well, have you ever stopped to consider that maybe the reason you're alive today as our world is turned upside down every day is not an accident. You know, people love to complain. You know, and it seems like our country's at a tipping point when it comes to racism, politics, violence, inflation, wars over basic biology and corruption. I hear people say, you know, I don't recognize our country anymore. We hear it all the time. You feel like escaping to greener pastures in Idaho and Texas? Have you ever stopped to think? Have you ever stopped to consider that maybe you were born to live as a Jesus follower in an anti-Christian society on the outskirts of the most anti-Christian metropolitan area in the country in 2022 for such a time as this? Maybe that's why we're here. We've been praying for several years that this campus would be a stronghold of the kingdom. Maybe that's why we're here. We have all of these these booths around here with all these different ministries. Maybe that's why all these ministries exist. Maybe it's for such a time as this. And that's our vision. But again, just like with Esther, knowing God's at work in the midst of darkness, it doesn't mean it's easy, but it may mean stepping out and taking a risk. Well, Esther was here for such a time as this, and look at what she does, verse 15. Look at her response. 
Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Isn't that interesting? I read that this week going, wow, we're in the middle of a a 30 day month long fasting and prayer. Fasting is when you, you give up something that satisfies your flesh, like food or your cell phone and, and, and you give it up. You're sacrificing something in the flesh for a spiritual request. And every day, I mean, we, if you're part of our gathering here, we fasted from breakfast this morning as a church, praying for revival in this church, revival in this country. That's why we fast. Well, she says, hey, gather people to fast for me. I don't want to go into this alone. Do not eat or drink for three days, day or night. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. You know, I want you to notice Esther's circumstances, they didn't change. She still lived in a society utterly hostile to the Judeo-Christian worldview. She was still in danger, but God's priority isn't our safety, comfort, or success. God's priority is our obedience but she didn't go alone. She gathered prayer warriors to pray over her. This church, we need prayer warriors. If you have a heart for prayer, we have our prayer team right over there. God's raising up an army of prayer warriors gathering every Thursday night, 6.30. We're praying over this church, over the people in this church, over the lives in this church constantly. We need those prayer warriors. And she, she gathered prayer warriors. Well, the last blank there, this is our vision as a church. The people of Calvary Mac are here for such a time as this. This is why we live different. This is why we teach different. This is why we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Bible. It's for such a time as this. This is why we do church different. We don't just want to come and, and, and use the same old approaches to church that have been done for the past, you know, 50 years. We're going to be different. We're going to live different because we are here for such a time as this. This is why we've launched Wired. And you can see there at the bottom of the notes, there's a picture of, of Wired. And, and let me, I, we actually fasted for Wired this week. Who fasted for Wired this week and didn't even know what it was? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what the heck is Wired? Well, let me tell you what Wired is. I had this great idea back in March. We have a, an online class called Planted where it's, it takes like an hour and it's a, it's a Christianity 101 class and it doubles as our baptism class and you go through it. Who, who's taken Planted before? Let me see, raise your hands. I know there's more than like three of you. There's been like 80 people have taken this thing. And there you, there's a few more, but you go through and you take it. And I'm like, what we need is we need to have a class like that. Like an online class takes an hour that goes through and takes some talent inventories and maybe like a, a spiritual gift test. And then it gives you a few ideas of how you can get involved in serving, how you can minister to other people. I'm like, hey, that's great. Let's do it. So I started working on it in April. And I kept doing it and, and like I kept working on it. Two months later, <laughs> we're talking now April, May, June. I tell my wife, I'm like, Becca, this is the best stuff I've ever come up with but nobody's going to do it because it's too long. There's too much information. And my ideas of spiritual gifts and, and how they work were completely flipped upside down. I'm like, because I, I'm looking at like what's out there when it comes to spiritual gifts. I'm like, it's all it, like, it's, it's, it's so different than what the Bible says. I'm like, well, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about spiritual gifts? Most of the spiritual gift tests They'll one, they'll make up a bunch of spiritual gifts that aren't even in the Bible. And then they'll leave off a bunch of spiritual gifts that are in the Bible. I'm like, what? And so I kept working on it. And I'm, I, and I'm just, I keep working on it. And it, it's literally, I've worked on it since April. And it's turned into this huge thing where I'm like, nobody's gonna do this. And then God says, do it in house churches. Oh, there we go. 
So I was like, great. And so I took it, I said, well, I'll make it into like a curriculum, a video curriculum for house church. And so I, 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 I record all these videos and they're all set, they're all ready to go. And then God, you know, I'm just, you know, not like God's audible voice saying this stuff. I just impressed by the Lord to say, he's like, hey, so I want you to put it into writing for people who aren't tech savvy and, and don't have a computer. I'm like, okay, cool. So I basically take all the notes and I, I put it into it and, and it turns into this book. Okay. I'm not an author. And it turns out being like this 150, 160 page book. I'm like, I didn't even know that there, were, there was that much information. And so, uh, then I just kept working on it. And that is what wired is. It's basically, you can see, this is kind of the cover of it. It's how you're wired, how you're called and how to plug in. And it comes up with like a talent inventory, your passion inventory, your spiritual gift inventory. The whole point of this is to get you to discover how you're wired so you can plug into different ministries. So that as we talk about, we are here for such a time as this, it allows you to practically respond to it. Because so many people feel like, oh man, the world's falling apart. I don't know what I can do to make a difference. Well, that's the point of Wired is to make a difference. Does that make sense? And so I lied. Here's one more blank. The last blank on this. The point of Wired is to mobilize people to discover how God has wired them. Hear the voice, the hear their God-given calling, step out of their comfort zones, and begin living for Jesus Christ for such a time of the, as this. That's what this ministry fair is about. It's helping you to jump out and not just listen, but to step to get out of the seats and begin living for such a time as this. Two final challenges here. The final challenge is we're going to, in a moment here, we're going to have one more song and then Jessica's, Jessica's going to come up and she's going to give you an overview of how the ministry fair will work. And we're going to have burgers and we're going to have hot dogs. It's going to be awesome. We've been smelling them cooking up there. Um, it, and it'll be great. But my challenge is this, is I want you to visit every single one of these booths just to find out what's going on in the different ministries of the church. But then the second thing is this, my challenge is this, is join a house church. We're going to be launching house churches here in the next two, three weeks. It's really important that we don't just gather as a large group, but that we gather as house churches around the community. So I want to invite you to the house church booth is over there. There's, is that Darren over there? Darren's over there. You can see them over there. It says house church and, uh, right next to the prophecy classes there as well. Um, but just sign up for a house church. And, and another challenge is if you've been feeling like, hey, maybe we could host a house church. All of our house churches are full. We need more house churches. So maybe you might want to sign up for one of those. But I'm going to have the band come on up here. I was supposed to have them come up here a little bit ago. So we'll see how fast they can come up. We're going to time you. But as they come up, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this community of believers. I, I, we thank you for how you are raising up an army of people in this church to be a light in the darkness. God, I, I pray that as we gather, it wouldn't just be about coming here and being poured into as buckets that just kind of take in but instead that we would be pipes, that we would be conduits of your power, your authority, and your love into this community. Lord, that you would transform McMinnville, transform Yamhill County, Dayton, Willamina, Sheridan, even up into Forest Grove and Gaston and Newburgh, Dundee, Carlton. God, would you just, Amity, Lord, bring revival. 
and use the people of this church for such a time as this. Only go ahead and stand.